Welcome to Scrubcast, where we explore clinical, translational, and health services research from Stanford University's Department of Surgery through conversations with the authors. I'm Rachel Baker. Our guest on this episode is Dr. Anna Luan, a chief resident in our Division of Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery. Thank you for coming on the show. Thanks for having me, Rachel. Dr. Luan published an article in the March edition of Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery titled Expansion of Reconstructive Surgery Capacity in Vietnam. I think most of our listeners are familiar with the standard medical mission model, but your article describes a visiting educator program. What's the difference between the two? That's right. Research International was started actually in the 1960s as a organization called Interplast. Um, so they have a long history of global reconstructive surgery. And they were really one of the first groups to pioneer this type of global surgery, which is really focused on um, education and training. And like you said, the traditional, more mission type model flies groups of surgeons in for a short period of time, usually a week or two. They do as many operations as possible in another country, and then they fly back to their home country to resume their normal work. But the idea behind the visiting educator trip model is to provide what we think is a more sustainable and less disruptive way to increase surgical capacity globally. And so the goal is not only just to fly in people to do operations, but to really train um, and educate the local surgeons to be able to do those operations, not only during that period of time where the visiting educator is there, but um, also after they leave. And so that really provides a sustainable way to uh, continue those operations even after the trip is over. Awesome. So it looks like your publication looked at 12 trips over five years, which seems like a bit of an undertaking. How was this effort all planned? Yeah, so the staff at Research are incredible at this, and they've been running these trips for a number of years now. Um, but it does require a lot of coordination. It all starts with actually the host surgeons and identifying local surgeons who are motivated to help their communities and learn these um, new procedures um, to fill in the gaps in care in their uh, local communities. And so we start by identifying those surgeons and really asking them what the gaps are. And so they'll tell us, you know, maybe we don't know how to do mandible distraction. And so then we take that idea and then uh, explore our network of surgeons here in the U.S. and sometimes in Europe um, and find experts in those topics and invite them on these trips. So these trips are typically a week in length, and we bring not only an expert surgeon in the topics that the local surgeons want to learn about, but also a multidisciplinary team of um, depending what the topic is, it can be anesthesiologists, it can be hand therapists, it can be speech therapists, it can be nurses, and um, really try to bring a multidisciplinary type of training to the local team um, to really fill in that gap for them. I love that you ask the host surgeons what they want to learn instead of assuming you know what they need. Jumping down to the results section, you seem to have shown that this model really does work, correct? Yes. And so that was the big question because we've been doing these trips for years now and um, other organizations also do similar types of training now that a lot of the focus has shifted away from traditional trips. But it's never really been demonstrated that they're actually sustainable and effective. And it's fairly reasonable for anyone to assume that, yes, training and education are good, but it's important, I think, for us as an organization that does these trips that we actually prove that they are effective and have a sustainable effect, number one, for ourselves, 
to know that we're heading in the right direction in improving surgical capacity, but also from a more practical standpoint for donors so that they know that their money is going to a place that is actually uh, having an impact. That's a really good point because I'm sure your work relies quite a bit on those generous gifts. I'm wondering if in your research you noticed any room for improvement yeah um so you know i think the biggest thing that comes to mind is so surgical capacity or or surgical volume is Mm -hmm. a really important measure for us because we know that low and low middle income countries they represent nearly half of the global population but they're receiving less than actually 15 percent of surgical care. And so, yes, we definitely care about the volume of cases being performed and the Mm -hmm. volume of surgical care being delivered. And that's what we measure here in this paper. But it kind of begs Mm -hmm. the question, but what is the quality of Mm -hmm. the surgeries being performed? And, um, you know, I think even though anecdotally and qualitatively from speaking to our local surgeons abroad, that they feel like they have seen an improvement in um, some of the techniques that they've uh, learned mm-hmm. on these trips, we don't have good data to really show that. We have some bits of data to show that, yes, our cleft palate outcomes are better um, after these trips. Um, but it's really limited. And I think if we could demonstrate improved outcomes and improved, Mm -hmm. especially improved functional outcomes for these patients, that would be really meaningful. Um, But unfortunately, because it's so hard to collect Mm follow-up outcomes in a lot of these settings, we're just not there yet. Um, And so I think that would be a huge step forward for everyone in global surgery to be able to have that kind of data. And there are so many barriers to being able to get there, but if we can, that would, that would provide a huge missing piece of information. Definitely. That would be very cool to see. I'm interested to know how you got acquainted with Research International and whether or not this was your first foray into global surgery. Yeah, um, that's a great question. So Research International, or Interplast as it was known initially, um, has a very long history, actually, with Stanford Plastic Surgery. Um, Its founder is uh, Don Laub, who was a uh, plastic surgeon, now retired, and he was actually a former chair of our division. Um, And so we have for decades been involved with Research International, and more recently in the last five years or so, they've created a fellowship called the Laub Fellowship in honor of uh, Don Laub. Um, And that provides an opportunity for a resident or fellow to spend a year with them to really focus on global surgery and work closely with Research International. Um, And so I became involved with research through that connection, um, and it's been a really um, meaningful experience for me. It was my first real experience with global surgery. I'd always been interested in it, Um, but I think up until that point, I didn't really feel like um, I had the right skill set to bring to contribute meaningfully. And I think this fellowship and working with research really allowed me to do that. I feel like such a dunce that I never put that together. Laub, the fellowship, Laub, the founder, and Laub, the former chair. I suppose I should spend more time in front of the portraits at 770. Uh, It is, I believe, your final year of residency, correct? Yes, that's correct. Congratulations. What is next for you? And do you hope to include global surgery as part of your professional career? Yeah. So first of all, I can't believe that it's coming to a close. It does fly by in the end. Um, And next year, I'll be heading to uh, MGH in Boston for hand fellowship. Massachusetts General Hospital, correct? 
Correct. Yeah. Okay. Harvard affiliated, I think. Right, right. That's not prestigious at all. <laughs> it's the Stanford of the East Coast, right? <laughs> Exactly. Don't, don't tell them I said that. I hope. <laughs> but I'll be uh, spending a year there learning more in depth about hand surgery or hand and upper extremity surgery. And um, I absolutely want to stay uh, involved with global surgery in the future. Um, I think it's proven to be really meaningful for me. And I think it'll tie in nicely too with hand surgery because there's so many both congenital and traumatic hand conditions that are not fully treated abroad. And so I hope to eventually bring that kind of subspecialty training and combine it with my passion in global surgery in the future. Awesome. I'm always intrigued about how people decide on specialties and subspecialties. Why did you decide hand? Yeah, you know, it... It's hard. I entered into residency really Um, Mm open-minded. And that was one of the things that really drew me into plastic surgery was that we operate everywhere all over the body and it can involve, you know, trauma or congenital defects or cosmetic surgery um, and everything in between. Mm -hmm. Um, And it was in a way a little bit hard to be narrowing down to you know, just the hand and upper extremity. Um, and I think, number one, I, I have fantastic mentors who are hand surgeons, and I think that has definitely influenced me. Um, but number two, I think, um, you know, yes, it's anatomically more confined than the wider range of plastic surgery, but there's so much variety in the hand in terms mm-hmm. of, the types of conditions, but also the um, really intricate anatomy. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think that really drew me in. Um, I have kind of a bioengineering, biomechanical background. And so that actually ties in really nicely with hand also. Uh Um, And so it's really a good combination of my past experiences and interests. And I'm really excited to see where things go. That is Fantastic. I'm excited to see where you go to. Pop quiz, how many bones are in my hand? I'm trying to count. <laughs> I have to, I'd have to count too. So <laughs> uh, I don't, that's like a factoid that I can't remember. <laughs> I'll look it up and put it in the description for all of those people who are just dying to know. Uh, <laughs> thank you so much for coming on the show. It was a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you so much for having me. And that brings us to the end of another episode. If you like Scrubcast, we hope you'll tell your friends and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Scrubcast is a production of Stanford University's Department of Surgery. Today's episode was produced by Rachel Baker. The music is by Midnight Rounds. And our chair is Dr. Mary Hahn.